right, welcome everyone. You've made it through a week of SLT. I'm sorry, but that's not the end. <laughs> There's a lot more to do. We'll get to that in a second. Physics five, six, seven, <laughs> eight. <laughs> I'd like to start by just thanking a few people who helped us make this possible. So first of all, Topos Institute, where, where we currently are, you can't really see it, but they've been all around us and they're very flexible and helpful and just gone out of their ways to make this happen and be easy for us. So maybe a little round of applause. Thank you. So Topos. Uh, and then I'd also like to thank all the donors. Uh, so. Larger donors, Survival and Flourishing Fund, Long-Term Future Fund, and then a few individual donors, Stefan, Greg, Alter, Vanessa Kosoy, and Svante Schultz. So thank you guys for making it possible. This talk, uh, we have two main things we're gonna be doing. So first is to look back at the week, to review the different talks and strands and see how they Rope together in three, three, three themes. So there's transitions, uh, the role of phase transitions, the role of geometry in dictating those phase transitions, and then the, the role of transitions in possibly circuit formation. Then we'll look ahead. Dan will sketch different versions of the plan uh, and what the applications of SLT or the broader field of developmental interpretability to alignment might look like. So let's start with transitions. The key hypothesis we have under transitions is that many significant qualitative changes in computation emerge through phase transitions, which we can detect. Now, if this is true, then the, the resulting contributions would follow. Now, we have good reason to think that phase trans transitions exist. So we saw in Rowan's talk, the example of induction heads, that these induction heads you know, evolve over a very short period of time. They exhibit several of the other catastrophe flags that Dan just talked about. We also saw in the you know, toy, toy models of superposition paper, already in the original paper, but more recent work by Dan, Edmund, and Susan, you know, further shows that there, there are real phase transitions taking place here. And I sketched a few other examples of these phase transitions in alignment too. Phase transitions don't just exist, they're natural, right? So in the physics track, we saw time and again that phase transitions show up all over the place. Especially in physics, we looked at transitions in the case of water, in the case of the icing model, so fer ferromagnetism. We looked at this small toy model. We looked at the random neural, uh, neural network to see examples of phase transitions in dynamical systems. And then Dan sketched this idea of phase transitions dominating developmental stages in developmental biology. So transitions are not exotic. They are a very natural thing to expect of, of systems going through changes, right? And then it's not just that they're natural, it's not just that they are, what's the first thing? <laughs> Existing. It's that transitions are, are crucial, right? We're not claiming that phase transitions make up all of the changes going on in neural networks. But to a large extent, they are the, the important ones, the ones that are discontinuous. And so we saw in Watanabe's lecture, right, the idea that regular models have this very predictable growth where they just become more and more Gaussian and concentrated around the true parameter. And the result of SLT is that that's not the case in singular models. You get phase transitions. And so the qualitative nature of the internal computation of these models can change. And moreover, transitions are legible. So we looked at generalized susceptibilities and saw that the existence of a phase transition implies also the existence of these susceptibilities, quantities that leave measurable traces that shoot off into infinity. Right? These are places where the microscopic interacts with the macroscopic. And finally, transitions matter for safety. A lot of the concerns we, we talked about in AI safety concern rapid discontinuous changes. We talked about sharp left, sharp left turns and treacherous turns. We talked about the emergent capabilities, right? So I sketched this, this picture of training being this, this process where you're navigating a landscape and trying to avoid 
these pits of lava. Now, of course, this is not going to be exactly correct. This is a cartoon. But you know, can we detect these kinds of points? Can we detect those moments in the developmental pathway where values crystallize? You know, where a stem cell has differentiated and can no longer go back. Can we prevent those things from happening in a, in a harmful way? Okay, so those are some of the basic takeaways we have about phase transitions. Now, if they exist, if, the, if this picture is, is true, then they could contribute significantly to safety. You. All right. <clears throat> Phase detection. So if we believe all those things about phase transitions, then we want to know uh, where they are, what they do, and uh, when they happen. So the idea is that we build tools, uh, sort of the equivalent of electron microscopes in solid state physics, uh, but in the context of examining, instead of divergences in the density of states in solid state physics, which exist many tools to measure, um, we want to develop equivalent tools to detect non-obvious phase transitions. So clearly some of the phase transitions we've talked about are in some sense obvious, right? You look at the loss, it goes down. Okay, something happened, then you go find out what happened. For that, maybe you don't need a sophisticated tool to know there was a phase transition. Maybe you need a tool to figure out what it is and what it's doing and what other structure it's related to. That'll come in a minute, but first you need to detect the thing. Maybe that's obvious. But there's no reason to think in very large models that it is necessarily obvious, given that you're measuring a certain class of metrics, that the phase transition shows up in those metrics. It certainly shows up somewhere, but it might, might not be where you're looking. Okay, so uh, yeah, so this is a picture of a, the result of a scanning tunneling microscope, which is uh, based on divergences in some susceptibility to do with conductivity as a function of um, distance. So when we detect a transition, uh, it involves some variables and not others. It's at some position in the parameter space. Uh, and that tells us uh, when to go looking for some change in structure. And actually, I've forgotten what you had in mind with this picture. <laughs> So I, I think it's mainly, uh, right, so you detect when a phase transition happens. We're not going to talk about more than that yet. That's in V2, right? Yes, yeah, so knowing when a phase transition happens is crucial because you don't want to be looking at every tiny step in SGD to analyze it for whether something significant has changed in terms of the safety profile of your system, right? You want to know that if there's significant change, uh, and under the hypothesis that the changes that are dangerous are actually significant enough in terms of change in structure to show up as phase transitions, um, you want to pay attention or at least relatively more attention when such things um, occur. So knowing when makes um, inspection cheaper, lowers the alignment tax. So another strain we looked at this entire week is the role of geometry, the geometry of the lost landscape. So here the hypothesis, the relevant hypothesis, is that only a few degrees of freedom control phase transitions in neural networks. Right? So we saw how the geometry determines dynamics in physics three. We looked at many different phase portraits and saw what those looked like and that they were dictated by the presence of a few individual singularities. And we saw that singularities determine transitions in physics four, lecture on catastrophe theory. Right? And so in physical systems, it's very natural that only a few parameters control transitions. But we hypothesize the same is likely to be true for larger neural networks, and especially further down the training process. So geometry determines dynamics, singularities determine transitions, and only a few parameters control transitions. Transitions are in some sense local, in a very careful sense. Okay, so detecting a signal that you're just getting from a function of the parameter tells you when a transition happens, uh, but where did it happen? That is, what parameters are involved? Right? 
So here's a diagram which shows a phase transition from one singularity to another, and the red edges are the weights that are actually involved in the transition. Uh, of course, there will be sort of a gradient, uh, maybe a continuum is a better word. There's a continuum of whether or not a given weight is involved. And in the example I was talking about earlier in SLT high four, there were some variables that changed a lot over the course of the phase transition. That's the new structure that's emerging. There are some that change a little. They're like the interfaces with the other components that are maybe shifting a bit. And then there are some that are completely unchanged. Right? That is the location of the phase transition in parameter space, right? that set of concerns about relative involvement in a phase transition. And developing a spectroscope or some kind of tool for examining phase transitions is not only about knowing when it happens according to various metrics like divergences, but knowing which variables are involved and in which capacity are they involved. Knowing where to look also makes inspection even cheaper, right? You don't have to run your tool over all 100 billion parameters if there are only some relatively smaller subset that are actually relevant uh, in some critical way to the transition. And finally, we talked about formation, especially in the mechanistic interpretability streams. We talked about this idea of features and circuits forming over the course of the training process. Here, the relevant hypothesis for us is that the set of phase transitions and phases encountered during training determine you know, the, the, the final computational form. We talked about the universality hypothesis, right? That neural networks learn universal features and circuits. This is the idea that different architectures trained maybe on different data sets still come to learn similar computational structure. And we saw the same in the indu induction head statement. We looked at the idea of universality in a much broader context. We talked about universality in critical phenomena where you have these critical exponents that turn out to be the same across very different microscopic systems. We talked about universality in the context of random matrix theory, where it turns out that the eigenspectra of random matrices are heavily you know, normal and, and really only subject to a few symmetry conditions and overall properties of the, the matrices. And we looked at this classification of elementary catastrophes, catastrophes that are similar in shape across a wide range of different systems and that there are only finitely many, and a rather small number, fortunately. Right, so structure emerges through transitions. And this is a picture we especially see through the analogy with developmental biology, where precursors are necessary before, before new structure emerges. So in some sense, if you have serial computation structure, phase transitions are the natural thing you expect to, to lead to the advent of new structure. And we saw an example, a very practical example of how we might study function through geometric development. We saw in the toy models case that we can actually link the evolution of these n-gons, the k-gons here, to the singular structure of the, of the lost landscape. So neural networks learn universal features and circuits Structure emerges through phase transitions, and we can study functions, the function of these models through the geometric development. All right, phase interpretation. So what is the goal of mechanistic interpretability? What does it produce, right? I mean, what does reverse engineering of a computer program produce? Well, it produces a program, right? You have a target for interpretation. So what is, the, what is the target mathematical structure for mechanistic interpretability? It's some model of computation, right? We believe it's an algorithm of some kind, probably not like a C program uh, because not everything in there is symbolic, right? There's some kind of representations that are irreducible artifacts of interacting with a world um, that feeds you inputs through senses, right? So not all of it is symbolic, probably. Um, but the symbolic part, what kind of thing is that? Uh, is, it, is it a Turing machine? Is it pseudocode? Is it lambda calculus? We have many different models of computation, which are the same as these two are the same in the sense they have the same expressivity, 
But don't be mistaken, Turing machines and Lambda calculus are not the same thing. They, they talk about computation in different ways. For example, you can see computational complexity in the left-hand side, but not so easily in the right-hand side. Okay, so they're different models of computation. What kind of model of computation are we looking for as the output of our interpretability tool? Right? Well, one way of thinking about these objects as being not really fit for purpose in terms of interpretability is uh, to pay more attention to how they emerge, right? Like you don't, you don't programs in Turing machine, uh, a Turing machine or a Lambda calculus term don't appear from nowhere, right? They're built by us line by line, perhaps symbol by symbol in a Turing machine or term operation by term operation in Lambda calculus. Right, so you might think about forming a, Turing, a code for a universal Turing machine as varying one bit at a time. Uh, that would be maybe stages of its construction, but that's not necessarily automatically a natural idea in thinking about UTM codes. However, on the side of Lambda calculus, it's very natural to think about a program uh, in Lambda calculus as being constructed in stages. That's the whole content of the Curry Howard correspondence, which says that the computational content of a Lambda term is the knowledge of how it was constructed by deduction so in some deep sense. So that's not a strange way of thinking about programs as being essentially about the means to construct new programs from old ones. Okay. Uh, so on this basis, uh, what we're saying is something like, okay, rather than thinking about flipping bits or thinking about updating a Turing, updating a Lambda term by applying deduction rules, and this is the process of construction of a program. Instead, think of the target of mechanistic interpretability in neural networks as being some kind of object which accretes structure through second order phase transitions, uh, through phase transitions, which are associated to catastrophes. Those are the sort of equivalent of deduction rules under this analogy. I thought you were doing this. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is the pep talk bit. Are we ready for the pep talk bit? I think we're ready. Yeah, we're ready. Okay. So next week, um, we're going to solve all these problems. <laughs> <laughs> then we're safe. <laughs> so we'll have a bunch of open problems. We've mentioned a bunch over the course of this week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're putting together a list on the Discord. It's an open problems channel. We'll be adding to that. Uh, there are many projects that are just sort of ready to get started on, many open questions to discuss. I can add a little more. So, so we will be forming groups and actually working on things. Uh, we'll be giving talks. So if you haven't signed up to give a talk yet, please do. We'd love to hear from everything and it doesn't have to be immediately related to all the, the themes you've seen here. So uh, yeah, please tell us what you've been working on and we're gonna see how far we can get into this. You know, there will be room for the more theoretical approaches, for the more experimental approaches and for the in-between. All right, so stepping back for a moment. Um, as I said in my welcome lecture, it's not an accident that uh, SLT is being uh, connected to some of these new phenomena in machine learning, right? Because it's really for the first time in computer science that we see some of these phenomena, scaling laws, emergent capabilities. These are things that belong to other systems that we've studied, but computer science and our computer systems have reached a scale where we start to see these things also there. Um, and that's starting to bring in other parts of mathematics. Right? And SLT touches on many parts of mathematics, algebraic geometry, empirical processes, probability theory, statistics, functional analysis. Um, is there a field of mathematics I haven't mentioned? Com combinatorics? <laughs> Maybe not yet. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Super problem. Um, so SLT, even on its own terms, is a beautiful piece of mathematics. And these new objects of study in machine learning would be interesting, even without concerns about alignment or AI safety or interpretability. Um, but we do have those concerns. Right? So uh, I think it's a good time to be pushing on the theory and also the applications and everything in between. And there's every reason to expect that we can make rapid progress over the coming years. So I think we should get started. And uh, what could be better than having beautiful math to do and a very strong reason to do it?
It's uh, called being well motivated. So thanks everyone. Is there anything, something you want to add? We're just getting started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe something else that you, you, you mentioned to me right before this, right? It was a surprise to a lot of people that transformers just kind of work. Mm -hmm. that, that these deep neural networks, you just throw more data at them, you throw more parameters at them, more compute, and they just keep getting better. And so if, if you, you know, make that observation, you don't also update to the fact that maybe we can also expect significant theoretical progress and significant theoretical breaks with, with history. Well, maybe not regarding the, the phenomenon correctly yet, right? So it's, it's not unexpected if the theory that we, that we end up with to describe these systems is somewhat different from the theory we've had before. With that, there is a lot of theory to fill out. So join us next week. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see everyone there. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks everybody. Time for some singular beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Transition. No. laughs>